Hi guys, Mr. Davis here. This is the second of our lessons on uh, the new set of lessons in our section B on skill acquisition, specifically focusing on information processing. Now in the last lesson, we looked at the information processing model. And to begin with today, just as a knowledge recall task, I'd like to answer the six questions shown on the uh, screen here, all about that model. Okay, so if you pause the video here, make sure you've got an answer written down for each of these ideally from your memory, but if not, then certainly refer to your notes to make sure that you've got something down for each of them and we will check the answers once you are done. Okay, so let's go through these one at a time. Hopefully you've been able to remember this from last week. So the name given to the available information presented to the sensors at the start of the information processing model, and that is the display. So all of that information is on display and you take it in and then you process it before actually uh, deciding on an action uh, and then seeing how successful that action was. But the availability of that information is what is known as the display. Five key sensors used in sport. So picking up that information from the display, you should have sight, which is otherwise known as vision, auditory, which is hearing, and then touch, balance, and kinesthesis. If you take a minute, you could probably think of different examples from sport which fit in with each of those sensors. Part of the model uh, which selective attention is relevant to, that is the perceptual mechanisms. So in the GCSE format, we looked at a more simplistic model where selective attention was relevant to input. Okay, that is still essentially part of it, but we need to now be thinking about it as perceptual mechanisms. So one of those three boxes at the top, the first one at the top of that model Three stages of perception. So this was this additional bit of content that we threw into the mix. There are three stages of this process, detection, comparison, and recognition. You need to know what they are and what happens in each stage. The name given to the main part of the decision-making process is the translatory mechanism. So that central box at the top of the model, that's the main decision-making part of the process. Uh, you need to be clear on that. And then finally, the two key parts or the two key types, sorry, of feedback received at the end of the process. So once you've performed the action and the muscles have acted on the information, you then get intrinsic and extrinsic feedback to basically judge the success of what it is that you've just performed. Okay. If any of that is not clear, then I urge you to go back over that presentation just to make sure you've got a really good understanding of it. Please make sure that you've purple penned your work and written in any corrections before we move on. Okay, so what we're looking at today is something called the memory system. So if you have that down as your title, the learning objective is to learn how information is stored and retrieved during sports performance. Four key phrases or four key words that we need to be clear on as well. If you note these down, we will go into great detail on each of them, but for now, you just need to have noted down the central executive, the phonological loop, the visuospatial sketchpad, and the episodic buffer. Pause the video here, make sure you've got all of that information down, nice and neat, title, date, learner objective underlined at the top, thank you. Okay, so this is the model that we're gonna be looking at today. It's known as the working memory model. What I need you to do is draw out that diagram, nice and uh, neat. Make sure it's fairly big and clear on your page. And we're going to go through each of these um, boxes in, um, in more detail now. OK, before we get on to the individual detail, I just want to give you a little bit of contextual information about what's going on here. So at the top of this process, you've got something called a central executive. So if you think about it in, in terms of a business or an organization, each one of those will have a boss. Now, the boss or the manager has overall control over everything else. And its key job is this delegates. It delegates the jobs out based on the information that is received through the sensory receptors. And it decides which system or which part of its organization is best suited to deal with that information. Where can that information be stored and be processed into something that's more meaningful before being sent on? to the long-term memory. So you don't need to know a huge amount more about the central executive other than that it's just 
the overall um, leader in terms of dictating where the information goes once it's initially been received. It doesn't do anything with it. It's not the worker in this whole process. It delegates the jobs to these other organisations underneath it, or these other systems as we all know them. Now, these different subsystems are sometimes called slave systems because they are doing the work for the central executive. So they perform different functions, they operate in slightly different ways, and they help to store and organise that information. So they don't all do the same thing. They've got a different kind of speciality that they focus on. And then once they've dealt with that information, it will be returned back to the boss, the central executive, who will then decide what the next stage of the process is. Okay. And this model was put together by two scientists called Badley and Hitch, and their names may come up in the exam. So as soon as you see that, you need to be thinking Badley and Hitch, working memory model. Okay. Now, the one key bit of information or part of the model that's not shown on here is this bit, the long term memory. So what, what I want you to do is add that in now on your diagram. Now, different models of this will maybe show these different systems and these different parts of the of the model in a slightly different way. OK, I think this one on the left is the easiest one to work with. So that's why I've included it. Um, but for some reason, they didn't include the long term memory in this in this initial image. Now, as well as the little box here, just like on this one, you need arrows that come down from the episodic buffer and arrows that also go back up. So what that's essentially telling you is that information is being sent down to the long-term memory, but it's also then retrieving it or receiving it back from the long-term memory. So it's a two-way process in the same way as the information here is being sent down to the phonological loop. Phonological loop does its thing and then sends it back up to the central executive. Same here and same here. Okay, so it's a two-way process throughout this. Now, there are various different images that if you research this on uh, in any more detail, you might see a slightly different arrangement of these subsystems. So, for instance, on this one, you've got the episodic buffer that's on a slightly different level. Don't worry too much about that. OK, the key thing is that the central executive is at the top. That's the boss. That's what delegates the different jobs to these subsystems. OK, and we're going to go through um, what each of these subsystems actually does. OK, so once you've got that image down, we'll move on to the, the more detailed part of the presentation. So the first one we're going to look at, the first of these slave systems or subsystems is the phonological loop. So the key thing with this is it deals with spoken and written material. So auditory information, things that you are hearing. Think about that in a sporting context. What sort of things might you be hearing? when you're involved in sport, that information is going to come up. Essentially, you're going to listen to it and hear it. It's then going to get sent through to the central executive. Central executive thinks, right, this is auditory information. I need to send this on to the subsystem, which is going to deal with this. That subsystem is the phonological loop. And it's got two key parts. The first part is the phonological store. So the inner ear, the bit of the system that just holds the information and it's linked to speech perception. So you are aware of this sound and it holds the information in a speech based form. For instance, like spoken words that you can hear for just one or two seconds. So it's not a long term process, but it just retains that information for a short period of time. You've also got the articulatory system which is the known as the inner voice. Now that inner voice is linked to speech production and it's used to rehearse and store verbal information from the phonological store. So when you first hear something and then you repeat it, so for instance, if you meet someone new and they tell you their name, you then might say it again a few times in your head. That process is the inner voice repeating the information that you've just heard to try and make sense of it so you're then able to recall it again 
you do the same thing when you are trying to learn a phone number and someone gives you the phone number and you organize it into kind of slightly smaller sections of the full number and then repeat it in your head in those little chunks so then it, it makes more sense to you that process happens in the inner voice so initially you you hear that information and it goes into the inner ear the inner ear then says right i need some help in remembering this and it's the rehearsal and the storage of that then takes place in the phonological store okay so together they help to create something called a memory trace a memory trace which is essentially a, an initial idea or a snapshot of the skill that can that memory trace can then be sent on to the long-term memory okay so it's just the initial idea or concept of what's going on you've taken on board this information you've heard it you've processed it in the phonological loop and then you're going to send it back to the, um, the central executive that can then actually move it on to the long-term memory and we're going to look at what happens at that stage in a minute but to, the key thing is that uh, this, the memory trace from this part of the process so anything to do with auditory information is just organized in the phonological loop so what we need to think about is identify sporting examples of auditory information which would be presented to the phonological loop so try and think about it from different sports um, different examples what sort of auditory information could be presented to the phonological loop make a little list pause the video have a think about it put yourself in a situation a sporting situation what sort of things are you hearing that your senses would be able to pick up on and then that information would end up going to the phonological loop. So hopefully you've got things like this. Instructions from your coach. So you're hearing your coach give verbal instructions from the side of the court or the side of the pitch. That information would go to the phonological loop. And then there'll be a process of creating this memory trace. So essentially making sense of that information. It might also be calls of teammates, possibly even calls from opponents, or even the sound of uh, in certain sports like tennis or cricket. If you're hearing the ball hit the racket or hit the bat, that information is potentially very useful to you when deciding on what your response is gonna be. It happens very, very quickly but it's still useful information and it goes to the phonological loop. If you're hearing it, that's where it goes. Okay, the next part of it is the visuospatial sketch pad. So this is kind of on the other side of the model. You've got the phonological loop on one side, visual spatial sketch pad on the other. Again, in, in different diagrams, you might see one on the left and one on the right, and then a different diagram has it the other way around. It doesn't really matter, okay? But the visual spatial sketch pad, this deals with, as the kind of name suggests, visual things, so things that you are seeing and spatial information. So it's used, one of its key benefits is it's used for navigation, for creating maps. So you understand kind of a slightly, on a bigger scale, a slightly um, clearer image of, of what's actually on display, whether that be on a basketball court, on a tennis court, um yeah, it works in the same way as if you if you're playing games um like computer games and you've got an understanding of a sort of a, of a map so for instance if you're following a set thing on something like call of duty and there's like a map to follow and you're aware of it because you've been there before you know where to go uh, that's that's one of its key roles but it also helps to process information about the feel of movement so things like the flight of a gymnast during a vault. So that, while again, it happens very, very quickly, that information that comes into the central executive, central executive thinks, right, this is something to do with um, a visual bit of information. This is something to do with how I'm feeling. So that kinesthesis about the movement, that goes to the visuospatial sketch pad. Can you think of any other examples 
So I've said the, the flight of the gymnast. In what other examples might you have a sense of movement that's going to be useful to you in deciding uh, a response? So I would think of anything, any, I mean, anything where there's a significant amount of movements involved, particularly things to do with uh, where sequences enroll. So like anything to do with trampolining or anything like that, where you, it's important that you have an understanding and a sense of where your body is in relation to objects or obviously in that case, the trampoline. So that information is dealt with in the visuospatial sketch pad. So it's very different to the information that's going to the phonological loop, which is obviously auditory. So hearing information, it goes to one side, visual and spatial goes to the other side. And again, it's got two key parts. So the first part is called the visual cache, the visual cache. And that holds information about things like form and the color of what you're seeing. Now, in some cases that might be, might be useful, but the more important part in terms of sporting in sporting sense is what we call the inner scribe now the inner scribe deals with spatial and movement information so that's much more important than for instance the color of of something um, obviously if you're playing football things like the color of the shirt um, and that sort of thing is going to be relevant but primarily it's, it's sporting uh, actions are about movement so this inner scribe deals with spatial and movement information so one of the key things with that is that this information will enable you to recognize sporting actions and techniques that are being performed. And then you can decide on an appropriate action. So you can see how, for instance, um, an opponent in boxing might be shaping up to, um, to, to punch. And then you can decide based on that, obviously the, there's a lot more to the process, but the initial part of that process is the recognition of what's going on you see a technique being performed and then you act on it. And that process takes place in the inner scribe, which is part of the visio spatial sketch pad. What I want you to do is identify sporting examples of visual and spatial information, which would be presented to the visio spatial sketch pad. I've given you a couple there. Try and think of other examples. Pause the video here, try and come up with a little list. So, for example, you should be thinking of the sight of a ball coming towards you in, in any racket sport or, or bat and ball um, sport. The sight of the ball coming to you is obviously crucial information that would come to the Fisher Spatial Sketchpad. The sight of a teammate making a run so you can see them that they peeled off or, or um, darted in front of a defender. That's obviously crucial visual information. And then on a slightly kind of wider scale, <clears throat> The information of, for instance, an image, if you're about to take a free kick and you can see everything that's going on in front of you, almost like you map it out. Where are the defenders? Where are my teammates? Where's the wall? Where's the goal? Where's the, where's the goalkeeper? All of that information is kind of mapped out in your mind before you decide what it is that you're then going to do. Obviously, it could be in a live situation as well. So you just pick up the ball in the middle of the court, playing basketball, you look up and you see everything in front of you, opponents, teammates, runs people are making, where the space is, where the um, officials are, where the, the basket is. All of that information is kind of put together in a kind of a visual map in your mind. And that information is initially stored in the Visio Spatial Sketchpad. So, we then come to the episodic buffer. Now, this wasn't part of the original model. It was added in at a later date, but it has a crucial role. So the episodic buffer is responsible for coordinating the work of the other two subsystems. So it's the combination of the sight and the movement and that kind of map element of the information, and then combining that with the sound and the auditory information that comes into the phonological loop. So the episodic buffer kind of sits in the middle. Each of those other subsystems does their thing, sends it back to the central executive who goes, all right, that's useful, that's useful. Now, can we try and put that together? Is there, is there something here where this information can now be merged into something 
that makes sense that you can put the whole thing together so it kind of they send back this initial kind of trace if you like this memory trace from these different sides and then it combines it together so it's not then two different bits of information it, it pulls it together or chunks it okay so you've got some information coming through the from the phonological loop and potentially from the same situation you've got information that's been processed in the um, visuospatial sketchpad that then comes together to form something more meaningful and it's the episodic buffer that does that kind of chunking or coordinating of that information now one of the crucial things that it does is it puts it together in a kind of in a set order or sequence so it's it, it puts a sort of time frame on it that makes it um, more straightforward as an as a um, as a memory trace to be then sent to the long-term memory if it was just lots of bit, different bits of random information it would be really confusing for the long-term memory to work out what's going on and what action to take so the episodic buffer has the role of kind of pulling that information together making sense of it in terms of a sequence so it's patterned it's in a set order it's got a time frame and then it's sent on to the long-term memory the passing of these sequences begins the process of what they call um, motor programs being formed and movements occurring. So the motor programs are patterns of the whole skill. So it's received all of this information in the past. It's, it's, um, it's a, an organized set of experiences that you've got in your long-term memory, and that's known as a motor program. Now the episodic buffer, this organization and these sequences that are sent in the current moment, that process of organizing that information and then sending it on is the initial part of the process whereby uh, an action is decided on um, and then movement can then take place from there. So it's got an absolutely crucial role. What I want you to do is identify sporting examples which combine information from both of the subsystems, so the phonological loop and the visuospatial sketchpad, to form these sequences. So can you think of sporting examples where there's visual and auditory information that might be useful and that then comes together and is organised in the episodic buffer? Have a think. So it's a tricky task, trying to think of sporting examples where you might see and hear things. Pause the video here and try and come up with something, and then we'll check an example shortly. I'll get to that in a second. So on the bit that we were on, the bit in the red at the bottom, it's this, for, for example, it's the sight of the ball traveling onto an opponent's bat, but it's also the sound of the contact of that initial um, uh, contact so you're hearing something on the bat plus the kind of the image if you like of the speed and the trajectory of the ball as it comes off the bat and comes back towards you obviously that happens very very quickly and there's lots of information there that's being um, taken on board through the sensors but the key thing is it doesn't just kind of just end up uh, at the long-term memory as a big mishmash of information it's coordinated and organized through these subsystems and it's the episodic buffer that manages that so in this example you're seeing the ball go onto the bat you're hearing split second later the sound that that ball is making on the bat depending on in different sports is different but certainly in things like tennis you know the sound that um the ball will make on the racket will differ slightly depending on um the type of spin and the kind of the intensity of the spin that's been put on the ball. Uh, it's a difficult kind of thing to imagine if you're not a, a tennis player, but that's absolutely something that you can, you can recognize if you're a, a more elite or autonomous performer. And then that kind of mapping out of, you can see the, the, the swing of the bat, see the, um, the technique being used. And then it just, you can immediately get a sense of where the ball is as it's coming back to you, how far over the net, it is likely to travel you can cut you track the trajectory of the ball based on its speed and and kind of flight path that obviously happens incredibly quickly but all of that information 
comes together and is fed back into the episodic buffer. So as long as your example matches that sort of thing where there's information uh, that's auditory and information that's uh, visual and potentially spatial as well, that would be a good example to use. You're not necessarily going to get a question like that in the exam, but it's just important that you have a clear understanding of what goes on in the episodic buffer, because that is the sort of question that you might be asked, like, what is the role of the episodic buffer? And I've just added this in, it came up just before, but there's the section in green. So probably thought about this already, but it's a very difficult process to do this when there's lots of information involved. Okay. Can you remember what do you think is at the part of the decision making process that's related to information processing that makes this easier? Hopefully you're thinking this selective attention, this filtering of information that we looked at in the initial lesson on information processing. If you're able to filter out the most important things and the most relevant things that are helpful, plus disregard the information uh, that's, that's on display that you don't need, if you can do that well, then these subsystems have less, a, a less complex process they've got to follow because they're not dealing with such a massive wealth of information. They're just dealing with the actual really important information. And it stands to reason that the, the stronger a performer you are, the easier and more efficient this process is going to be. So next part. Now, most of the questions are likely to be to do with those subsystems, but you also just need to be aware of what the role of the long term memory is in this overall process. So the long term memory stores information based on past experiences and it's potentially storing a large amount of information depending on how you deal with it it could potentially store this information for a long long time arguably forever depending on on like the regularity that you use it and uh, the kind of the impact that it's had on your on your experiences and your memory if it's something that's very kind of significant it's more likely that you can remember it so if you think about it from a sporting context um which sorts of things are most likely to stick in your mind? So things that are particularly meaningful to you, things which might be related to um, moments of real success and the emotion that comes with that, but equally things where there's been a failing and a, um, you've got it wrong and that might have stuck in your memory as well. And it's all useful information and it's all stored in terms of its long-term storage in the long-term memory. Now, the crucial thing is this information is compared to the new information. So it's like, imagine you've got a, uh, a jigsaw in your head of a, of a, of a picture and you're, uh, you're repeating the jigsaw, but you're trying to do it really, really quickly. And the, jigs the new jigsaw, the image of that new jigsaw is then compared to the image of the original one that you've done correctly to see if it's right. It's, it's a comparison, it's matching it up. How well does this fit in with what I did in the past so it's a comparison which is sent through through the work in memory to the image or the um, the idea that you've got in the long term memory. And then the process kind of reverses where the information is sent back to the work in memory to be used, that should say, in the current situation. So just to be clear, you pick up all this information through the different sensors. It's the central executive that deals with delegating that information to the different subsystems. Some of it is auditory and will go to the phonological loop. Some of it is visual and to do with spatial awareness, and that's in the visuospatial sketchpad. That information, once organized, returns to the central executive, who then sends it on to the episodic buffer. The episodic buffer coordinates all of that information into one meaningful um, memory trace, which is sent on to the long term memory. The long term memory will then compare what it's received to what it's already got and then decide on what a suitable action is. That decision will then get sent back to the episodic buffer where uh, an action is then initiated. So it's a two way process receiving it, comparing it in the middle, so kind of in the long term memory, and then returning useful information and often in sport this has to be done 
very, very quickly. So there's two kind of key elements or two key challenges. One is the depth of information that this whole process is dealing with. So think about all the different information that's on display that you're having to process, but then also the time frame that you've got to do it in. So if someone's, if you're playing tennis and someone's serving at you at 150 mile an hour, there's a huge amount of information that you've got to deal with process before you can then actually action what your response is going to be a split second essentially that's how quickly this process can work and obviously the better uh, the stronger performer you are <clears throat> as i said before the easier and more effective and efficient this process is going to be so thinking of a sporting example can you describe a sporting example where the work in memory presents a memory trace to the long-term memory a comparison is made before uh, it's then returned to initiate an action. So think of a sporting example. So a particular instance in football, basketball, tennis. You've got information that's on display. You're taking it in. What is that information? Where is it going to go? What sort of image is that going to create in the episodic buffer once it's been through those other subsystems? What's that going to be then compared to in the long term memory before an action is uh, initiated? Pause the video, have a go at putting that together, even if it's just in bullet point form, and you can kind of compare it to uh, a model that I've, I've got. So, for instance, I'm using my tennis example again. In tennis, you're looking at the position of the opponent, so they might be quite far back on the court. So if you notice that, that's useful information. Okay, you would have picked that up um, through your through your vision. That information will go to the visuospatial sketchpad. You're also going to be looking at um, the ball landing short on your side. So it might be that you've heard that the, the ball hasn't come off their racket particularly cleanly and it's landed short on your side. So the combination of that auditory information, so you've heard it as a bit of a weak shot, and you've seen it land short, and you can see the opponent further back. This information is sent to the long term memory. It's compared what should I do? What would be a successful response to this information that I'm receiving? And in that case, it might be, for instance, performing a drop shot. That would be an appropriate response. So it's that sort of mapping out of this process that you need to be clear on. Not because you're going to get a question exactly like that, that's, that's not likely, but what it does do is it pulls all the information together. And if you can um, if you can communicate that level of information with clarity, that shows that you understand the full process and the different uh, roles of each of the different um, parts of this whole model. OK, so if you haven't managed to do that prior to my example, try and have another go at it now. Try and think of auditory and visual spatial information in a particular context, so mine is if the opponent's far back on the court and maybe you're thinking about a drop shot, what sort of information and how that process is completed, you need to be clear on. So the next stage, that's the whole model. Yeah, so that's the whole thing. So there's less information that you need to know about the central executive other than what its main role is. There's not so much information about the long-term memory that you need to be aware of other than its kind of role in the process. The detailed information that you need to be aware of is what is the primary role and how it functions, these different subsections or slave systems that operate in the middle of the working memory. So if you're not clear on that, please make sure that you go over that again and again until, you're, until you're, um, you've got absolute clarity on it. So next section is features and characteristics of the memory system. So this, to a certain extent, just summarises uh, the process, but you need to be aware of it and make the relevant notes. So I've done this in, in question format because it kind of relates to information that we've already looked at. So the first question is identify the name given to the information or the sequence which is sent to the long term memory. I'll go through all of the questions and then I want you to pause the video, have a go at putting the answers together. And then uh, and then I will clarify what the, the correct um, answer is. Second question is, what is the primary purpose of sending this information to the long term memory? If you want to pause it after each question, then obviously do that. Otherwise, I'll just present all the questions. <clears throat> 
what's the main problem encountered by the work in memory when trying to organize and coordinate this whole process? How does the memory system deal with this problem? What's another challenge that's faced by the work in memory? So that I, I mentioned two significant challenges that uh, the memory system would have, particularly in a, in, in a sporting context. What's the second of those? And what's the name given to the organized information stored in the long term memory? So pause the video there. Make sure that you've got an, an answer for each of those. If you need to go back through your notes or rewind the presentation to try and uh, get that information, then do that. Don't just copy it down from the next part of this because that's not good learning. So hopefully you've got answers down for each of them. Let's just clarify this information. So the name given to the information or the sequence which is sent to the long term memory is the memory trace. So the memory trace is created using the information from the phonological loop and the visuospatial sketchpad. It's then coordinated in the episodic buffer. That is the that sequence that organized sequence with a time frame is known as the memory trace. The primary purpose of sending this information to the long term memory is that it initiates the action. That's the first um, key element of this process, which is going to actually result in, a, in an action or a technique or a response taking place. The sending of the memory trace to the long term memory. Unless that happens, nothing else is going to happen. The main problem encountered by the working memory when trying to do all of this is that it's just got a, such a huge amount of information to deal with. So that is the, the main um, issue that it encounters. It has to happen fairly quickly, but it's difficult to process that level of information with any great accuracy or, or um, quality because it's potentially so much information um, that it's got to deal with of different types. So it's got to send that information off to these different subsystems. The different subsystems have to do their part of the process. It's then got to go back to the central executive and onto the episodic buffer to coordinate it before it's organized into this trace. That's a lot to do and a lot of information that's, uh, that it's dealing with. How does it do it or how does it help alleviate that problem? It uses this process of selective attention, it filters out what it's initially what's most important and disregards anything that it thinks is not going to be most important. So then the, these subsystems aren't having to deal with all the, the, uh, the extra irrelevant information and just focus on the most important parts. The other challenge that's faced uh, kind of links in together, but the process has to happen so quickly. So it's large amounts of information, but also the fact that it has to do this so quickly. Those are the challenges faced by the, um, the memory system. It obviously, in most cases, you know, you're able to do it, but it is a challenge. And the name given to the organized information that's stored in the long term memory is a motor program. So we're going to look at that in a little bit more detail um, next and, and in future lessons. But the motor program is this kind of um, organized. You've got all of this different bits of trace information coming in. But once that's actually in the long term memory, like if you imagine it as being the different elements or, or um, subroutines of a technique such as the layup the motor program is like the organized idea or concept of how to put that together as one smooth technique so the leg action the arm action the footwork and all, all that sort of thing that's the motor program it's an organized structure of of information in the long-term memory and you compare it to the information that you've got coming in okay so make sure you've got all of that information down um it may be best to, to try and do it in a way where there are subheadings or um you use elements of the question to, to just to make sure it's not just random bits of information like this and this try and actually organize it so it means something when it's written down because then you can use it for revision moving forward okay so make sure that that's um well organized before we move on okay and then there's this final part of this whole uh, process which is to do with actually storing the information how are you able to make sure that your long-term memory and your working memory uh, are effective in this whole process so it's not things that how are you going to remember um what to do and and how is your long-term memory going to be more effective uh, in this uh, in this structure so 
what techniques can be used to improve the effectiveness of the memory system so that learned skills can move back from the long term memory to the working memory. So when it's using it in its in, in the moment, in its current time. How can that process be improved? I'll give you an example to get you going, OK, and then I'll pause the video after I've, I've given you one and then um, we'll go through the rest of the, the techniques. There are lots of different techniques that you can use to improve this process. Essentially, it's linked into um, to, uh, stages of learning and the process of how you learn a skill and the sorts of things that are relevant to making sure that that process is, is, um, is of high quality and effective. So for example, making sure that the, the stored actions of a skill, uh, sorry, linking the stored actions of a skill to the stored emotion or another action. So for example, the feeling of success that you might get and you're able to recollect um, that, that feeling of a memorable past experience. So it might be, it might be, for instance, that you've got a reward, you got a, a certificate when you're able to do something particularly well. For instance, I don't know, in a trampoline routine or a gymnastics routine or say a vault, something that happens quickly. You can then associate that reward or that moment, that feeling of success. It doesn't have to be a reward. It could just be a feeling that you've got, but you associate that feeling to the performance of the skill. And it means that you're more likely to recall it and be able to use it um, in the future because it means more to you. So that is an element of what we call association. You're associating the feeling or potentially the reward to the actual uh, performance of the skill or the action taking place. Next one, mental practice and visualization. So practice in general, so repeating uh, techniques and action, that in itself is gonna be useful in terms of being able to store and recall and use this information. But particularly important is also mental practice or visualization or imagery. It's using uh, subroutines or potentially even parts of subroutines, so little elements of the technique which can be repeatedly imagined. So when you're talking mental practice or visualization, it's not to do with a physical performance, it's just to do with going over it in your head. And if you can play it out in your head, like I do this, then this is the next part of my technique. Now I do this and this is how I finish it. If you do that over and over and over again, as athletes routinely do, whether it's a performer taking a set shot or a penalty or before you serve or before you uh, kick a conversion in rugby, all of those things, you see them, they look at the goal, they look at the ball, they look at the goal, they look at the ball. And it's imagining it, the flight of the ball, the technique that you need to do as you approach it. It's that mental practice, which is going to make it a stronger uh, and more effective motor program, if you like, that you've got because you've gone over it and over it and over it in your head. It's particularly useful when you're uh, trying to recall sequences. So anything that has a particular order, like a trampoline in routine, where you don't have the time during the actual performance to go, Oh, right, I've done my somersault, what comes next? But if you've gone over it in your head before, then you know that it's pipe jump, straddle jump, half turn, seat drop, back drop, forward somersault. And if you go over it and over and over it, it just becomes automatic. That storage of information means that when you need to retrieve it, it's just there. It's there immediately. Now, as we said before, one of the challenges is the time that um, like you don't have a huge amount of time to do this. So if you can embed that information through mental practice, it just means that the retrieval process is that much uh, quicker because you're just going to an image that's very, very secure in your long term memory. Uh, another thing to do with practice is the use of part practice. So when you're learning these things, it helps to embed the subroutines, but particularly when you're learning complicated um, actions and techniques. If when you're during the learning process, you focus more time, this phrase that we've looked at before of overlearning it. That's not a negative thing. Overlearning just means it just becomes very, very routine. You do it over and over and over again. Take 500 set shots and try and use the same technique. So it becomes automatic. If you can do that, 
It just means that you're more likely to be successful and consistently successful um, when you perform the action as a whole at a later stage, because each part of the process has been completely embedded into your long term memory. So these phrases here, this, this idea of chunking where you kind of um, you learn it in stages I'm going to do that bit first, then I'm going to move on and I'm going to do the next bit of the technique. And if you isolate it, break it down, you're more likely to be able to then recall what each part of the process is when you have to do it all together. Chaining is quite similar, but chaining, if you remember, is to do with kind of linking them together. So rather than just learning them in isolation, chaining is where you learn the first part, then you add the second bit on, and then you do the first and second bit together. And then you learn the third bit and then you do the first and second and third bit together. So it becomes um, more of a routine or a sequence that's linked together. That's what chaining is. The other part of this, you could be looking at things like quality of guidance. So when you're actually learning it, that information that you're receiving in the moment when during that learning process, and particularly if it's relevant, and we spent a lot of time looking at the different types of um, guidance and which ones are going to be more effective uh, for different performers based on the ability and the skill that they're trying to learn. If you can use the right level and quality of guidance and potentially the right combination of that guidance, it means you're more likely to be able to remember things and then use that information because the motor program in your long term memory is going to be so much stronger that you can just go to it. Yeah, that's what it should look like. I learnt it so well before I can now just immediately see what that correct image is and then send that information back to the working memory as a comparison. And then finally, there are others, but you won't need more. So the, the other one that I've just made a note of is the quality of the feedback. So once you've performed it initially, it's that reinforcement, that, that repeated reinforcement of feedback, um, focusing like on key content, key teaching points, key elements that you would need to be aware of and remember based on the quality and the ability of the performer and the, and the skill that's being performed. So for instance, we're looking at cognitive learners who, uh, who can't retain and hold on to that depth of information. If your, informa if your feedback is short and it's simple and it's explained slowly, they're more likely to learn it. And if they're more likely to learn it, it's going to be stored in their long-term memory and then you can make better use of it during this process of retrieval. It's not scratching around looking for, oh, I need a clear image, I'm not really sure how to do it, because you've, you've spent such a, a great deal of time and quality um, in performing it and receiving the guidance when you're doing it and receiving the feedback after you've done it. All of that in terms of practice, the use of part practice, the use of mental practice as a separate process, and then the association of feelings when you've maybe performed it in the past those experiences all help to build up a stronger um, motor program in your head which can then be used to um, as a more effective means of comparison to what's the, the information that's being sent to it in the current time okay so you, you might get a question about something to do with retrieval of information and how information can be um, more effectively stored in the long-term memory any one of these things uh, is good to go. And that is that. That's the final part of this session. Hopefully you've made some good notes. Uh, it is a tricky topic with some um, kind of uh, testing terms. Please make sure that in addition to the quality of your notes, uh, I would just take a moment just to go back through it. Um, not necessarily the whole thing, but just fizz through it. Pause on any sections that um, maybe you'd, had stumped you a little bit as you were going through it think right I just need to go over that again to make sure you need to be very clear on what the overall process is what the different parts of the model are what the different um, characteristics and, and processes involved in the different subsections how that information is all collated together and then what what happens then in terms of the comparison and retrieval of information as it's sent to the long-term memory before then being sent back to the working uh, working memory for you to action an effective response. Okay, hopefully that's all good for you guys and I shall see you next time. Take it easy, bye-bye.